All right, so on Monday we stopped on slide 17 and we were talking about the descent of the testes and when that occurs. Um, so that might be a really easy question that I could ask you, like, do, do most infant boys, are they born without their testes descended or do they descend at puberty? Um, so you should know when they descend. It's in development in the uterus. So between 14 and 28 weeks, the majority of male fetuses have their testes descend. And almost 99% of them have descended prior to birth. So remember that. So what happens when the testes don't actually descend properly? Well, there's, there's a name for that. And that's a good name for you to know, the cryptorchidism. I think I said it wrong. Cryptorchidism. There we go. And this just literally, you need to know this definition. So basically, one or both test testes did not completely descend into the scrotum. And they can be in multiple different positions in the abdomen, in the inguinal canal. They're partially descended at the beginning of the scrotum. And so there's many different places where the testes can get stuck in those inguinal canals and not descend properly. If that's not fixed, then that person who has incomplete or undescended testes will not be able to have viable sperm. The sperm needs to develop at a colder temperature than your body's core temperature. So a person with cryptorchidism is most likely going to get a, a, a surgery to help with the descent of the testes so that they'll be able to reproduce as an adult. Okay, sperm cell development, we call that spermatogenesis. So you definitely need to know what that term is. <clears throat> spermatogenesis occurs in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. Okay, so you need to know where it occurs. And we're not going to go through the, every single little step of the development of a sperm, but you need to know where it is, where it is created, what's the term for the production of sperm, and also, neat little, little information for you is that it takes about around 74 days from the very beginning of a sperm's life to where it is finally mature. So each sperm takes essentially about two and a half months to mature fully. So that's actually, for me, when I first found that out, I thought that was surprisingly long, considering how much sperm can be ejaculated at a time. Millions and millions. Okay. Um, sperm cell development. So remember that they are produced in the seminiferous tubules. And there are two types of cells. Okay. So sustentacular cells and germ cells. The function of these sustentacular cells, notice another term for that is nurse cells, but most commonly sustentacular. These, they're there to help these budding uh, sperm cells. When they're at the beginning of this process, we call them germ cells. It helps <clears throat> to nourish them, and they might produce hormones as well. They also help form, which is really interesting, look at this, blood testes barrier. So the only other place in our body where we have like a blood barrier is a blood brain barrier. And we all have this. But with males, you have sustentacular cells that actually help form a blood testes barrier because your body, should your, the sperm enter your own bloodstream on accident for some reason, your body would recognize your sperm as foreign and it would attack it and so this is why we have well while the males have this blood sperm barrier or blood testes barrier to prevent your body from attacking your own sperm cells because your, your body would say they don't belong so it's kind of an interesting kind of a neat thing there um, so your body would not recognize your own sperm and then the second is germ cells, which is essentially your developing sperm. Okay, testosterone is a really, really big hormone in the male reproductive system. And please note, it is produced by what we call these interstitial cells. Those are found within the testes. So interstitial literally means in between. 
So these are cells that are in between other cells, and they're producing testosterone. And what is the big deal about testosterone? Well, I start it and fold it and italicize. Testosterone and receptors for testosterone are required for the sustentacular cells to function normally. Okay, so what's the big deal with the sustentacular cells? Well, the sustentacular cells, when the testosterone binds to them, it actually converts testosterone to what we would call dihydrotestosterone and also converts testosterone into estrogen. Okay? So those two hormones we would consider the active forms of that hormone. And so, yes, indeed, you do have estrogen in your system, males. Hey, and females, you have testosterone in your system. We each, so females need a little bit of testosterone to function properly with the reproductive system, etc. And the same with males needing a little bit of estrogen as well. Now, there's always that thing of when you have too much of the wrong hormone, then you have problems. <clears throat> so we're skipping 22, we're skipping 23. Okay, um, we're skipping this one too. Just, okay, so sperm. We're not going to spend time on sperm, div sperm division and development right now, but we need to talk about the anatomy of the sperm. There are three major sections to the sperm. You have the head. Let's see. There's the head. We have the midpiece. Um, it can be called different things depending on, like this picture does not call it the midpiece, but from here to here, this is the midpiece of the sperm, and then we have this big long tail. Okay? And nobody really ever talks about the end piece. No. The three major things head, midpiece, and tail. The head has the DNA of the, of the father, okay? And then at the top of that, you have this little structure called the acrosome. It's kind of like a little beanie put on top of the head. And the little beanie has these enzymes that will help eat through the, the wall of the, the egg of the female when they finally get there, okay? Um, the midpiece has mitochondria, which helps produce energy to allow that tail to move. Okay, and it's really important that that tail is going to, the flagella tail is going to be able to move because the sperm has to swim from where it was, re, you know, ejaculated, somewhere within the vagina, all the way up into the uterus, into the uterine tubes, all the way over close to the ovary. Okay, so they have to swim there to get there. If they can't swim or they don't have enough energy or mitochondria, then the sperm aren't going to make it. Okay, so... This is two, two important things here on this slide. First is, that is the exact picture in full color for the male reproductive system that you will need to be able to identify. This is slide 26. It does say it's the posterior view, but I find that it, this is just a great picture that shows the majority of the structures um, and also allows you to fairly easily trace where sperm is developed and how it travels up through the vas deferens, up and around and down, and the different glands and su stu such <laughs> that it passes through. And we'll talk about these glands as well. The other thing that, oh, yes, ma'am. Can we literally print that picture off? And I, you can. Okay. You can put anything you want on your cheat sheet, literally. Unless you found a way to copy my final, then that's not okay. Okay, so if, if you have room for a picture, put the picture. I don't care. Last year, one person just drew one picture, and it was hilarious. It was just the uterus and the way the per I think I kept it. I don't know where it is. The way the person labeled it, it was just, you could tell he was having a great time with it. It was fun. It was fun to grade. <laughs> okay, so the other thing I want you to pay attention to is the flow or tracing the path of sperm from where it is developed all the way to the outside of the male's body, okay? So 
I have very nicely made this order, this, this list for you where sperm is formed, develops in the seminiferous tubules, travels through the tubuli recti, reet testes, efferent ductules. So all three, whoops, oh, wrong color. That doesn't help very much. We'll do it in yellow. So all of, oh, come on, folks. I hit yellow. Okay. So sperm and the development and traveling until it leaves this major portion here. Can you see that I circled that in yellow? <laughs> So those first several things, seminiferous tubules, tubular recti, reet testes, afferent ductules, all of that is occurring before the sperm travel to the epididymis. And so the epididymis is this weird little structure that kind of sits on top. So the sperm then travels to the epididymis, and then it starts traveling up the vas deferens. So in your book, it says ductus deferens. Um, vas deferens is also a commonly used term. It's the same thing. So ductus epididymis, real quick, is this short little section of duct that is right there next to the epididymis. Then once you pass that, this is your vas deferens. I'm going to write it there because it says it's different than on your list. So ductus deferens is the same thing as your vas deferens. And then from there, your, the sperm travel through a series of, passes by a series of glands and then enters what we would call, where is the, the ejaculatory duct right here. Okay, so the sperm enters there. Secretions from the glands also secrete into that area and then it's pretty much, you have three sections of urethra um, for the sperm to travel through and then out of the male reproductive system. So please know the order of how, you know, the, how does the sperm travel out of the male reproductive system from the very beginning to the very end, okay? And identifying this picture. Skipping 27, 28, okay, spermatic cord. We talked about this matter. Well, we emphasized in lab protecting the spermatic cord of the mink because I wanted you guys to see that. And then also inside where we can see the vas deferens loop around and down behind the bladder. It's hard, the mink is really small, so it's kind of hard to see that stuff. But the spermatic cord, um, what do we have in there? So the spermatic cord is, so this is the abdominal wall right here. And this is the spermatic cord where it exits the abdominal wall and then down to the scrotum. Okay, so you have your vas deferens, the testicular artery, you have the testicular vein, or they say venous plexus, either is fine. You also have lymphatic vessels and nerves. And so it's, it's a very important cord, and so it's all bundled together, which helps keep them all pretty safe. And so within there, you have some very important structures. Um, so please remember the major structures of the spermatic cord, so you can see there's a, the veins, so that's your venous plexus. Um, it's kind of hard to see the, the red, but it's, it's there, and that is your testicular artery. And actually, if you followed it inside the abdominal cavity, you can actually follow the testicular vein and artery to where it connects to the larger vessels inside the abdomen. Okay, and there are multiple connective tissue coverings around the spermatic cord, and there is some muscle involved as well, the cremaster muscle. Remember, there are two muscles associated with the scrotum, and well, the scrotum and the testes. You have the cremaster muscle and the dartos muscle, so make sure you remember which one does which. And just as a hint, in this picture, the cremaster muscle, they have very clearly shown that the cremaster muscle is associated with the spermatic cord. So just a reminder, know the two male muscles, dartos and cremaster, and what they do. Okay. Um, okay. Just as a reminder, I've said this, but I'm going to be able to write it down now. The other word for ductus deferens is what? Fast deferens. Both of them are completely Import, uh, appropriate words to use, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, uh, there's not a lot to talk about in this particular slide. 
I just wanted to mention the vas deferens. Oh, note here. Okay, so in the vas deferens, surrounded by smooth muscle. Okay, so the vas deferens, a little tiny tube that you were able to see with the mean, actually a smooth muscle. So, because of smooth muscle, we have peristalsis that actually moves the sperm through that vas deferens. Okay, so smooth muscle, peristalsis, moving that sperm along its path. It's an important thing to remember. Now, we'll come back to that male anatomy picture more. It's always great to kind of refer to a picture as we're talking about some of these structures. But right now, talking about the male urethra, it's, it's like a complicated urethra if we compared it to the females. <laughs> So, first of all, about 20 centimeters long. Okay, so here's a meter stick. And so from 80, so for, from here to here on my finger, that's about 20 centimeters long. So, it's pretty long in a male. Females is about an inch-ish, so maybe, maybe like two and a half, max three centimeters long. Major difference there. Any ideas real quick? Um, of what kind of thing could affect, no, I'll come to that later. Okay, so first of all, three parts to the male urethra. You have the prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, and then spongy or penile urethra. So the prostatic one is the first one that the sperm come in contact with, okay? And it's short, and it's connected to the bladder, Okay, and then it passes right through the center of the prostate. The prostate is like the size of a walnut, but it's like a walnut donut. So there's a little hole in the middle, and that, the urethra passes right through the center of the prostate. And so that's why if your prostate enlarges, it's going to put pressure on the urethra, which then causes you know, urinary issues like frequent urination or needing to urinate and not able to because the prostate is kind of squeezing off the urethra. Okay, the second one, membranous. This, actually, this is the shortest section. And this is from the prostate to the perineum, which is basically the floor, the pelvic floor. And then the last is the spongy or penile urethra, which is the longest part, which extends from basically your pelvic floor all the way to the end of the penis. Okay? And so that is definitely the longest one. Each area actually is lined with a different type of tissue, different type of epithelial cell. So notice that most of it, though, is lined with stratified columnar epithelium, so it's thick-walled, because columnar, is, it's, it's really thick. Okay, and then you have transitional epithelium in the prostatic urethra, so within the prostate area, you have transitional epithelium. What's the purpose of transitional epithelium? Remember, it's in the bladder. It allows for stretching. Yeah, so there must be something going on there in the prostate. Think about that. And then near the opening of the sponge of urethra, down near the end of the opening, or I guess the end of the tip of the penis, you're going to have a different type of cell lining the inside of the urethra stratified squamous. And so remember, we only find stratified squamous in areas where we expect there to be a lot of uh, friction or cells rubbing off. And so kind of makes sense that at near the tip of the penis that the urethra there would be lined with that type of tissue. Okay. Um, again, this picture does show you, I mean, this ID slide shows you the picture again. So I'm trying to, it's right there. Um, and then you also can see a cross-section of the penis. And so really quick, we need to, there's erectile tissue in the penis and two major types of erectile tissue. You have your corpus cavernosum, which is highlighted in blue here in this picture. And so it's those two big ones. And then you have your corpus spongiosum, spongiosum which is the smaller um, erectile tissue area, and notice it's the corpus spongiosum that the urethra passes through the middle of, okay? Interesting thing to note, females have the same two types of erectile tissue. I'm going to try very hard for us to get there, okay? 
So another thing to note is the penis right here. There's a, it's called the root of the penis. There's two portions to that. And so the root is made up of two structures. One is called the bulb, the other is the cruse. So the bulb is kind of this rounded portion of the penis, and then the cruse is kind of more of this kind of pointed end here. Those two together make up the root of the penis, which would be inside the, the body wall. Okay, accessory glands, there are three major ones that sperm pass through, or no, that's not the right way to say it, I'm sorry. There are three major glands that secrete their products into the sperm, okay, for very important reasons. So first is the seminal vesicles. And so, first of all, what do you need to know? You need to know the name of the gland. You're going to have to be able to identify it. Okay, to so name the gland, you need to know what effect does the secretion from that gland have? What's the purpose of it? Okay, so seminal vesicle, it has a very important job. So first it secretes, well, it does give you, oh, that's the wrong color, fructose and citric acid, fructose actually is how you say it, that gives energy for the mitochondria to move the flagella, so energy for the sperm to move. But what does it do to the female reproductive tract? You have fibrinogen that's secreted, which causes kind of coagulation, and then it also secretes prostaglandins, which will cause or can cause contractions of the uterus. You want contractions of the uterus if you're trying to reproduce. It helps move the sperm further into the female reproductive system. The second gland is the prostate gland. And so the secretion is high in pH, which means it's very basic. And it does that because within the female's reproductive system, in the vagina region, it's more acidic. So you want to have a basic solution to kind of neutralize the acid in the female's reproductive system. The acid is there to try to kill your sperm. But prostate gland secretes a basic solution to neutralize that and also clotting factors that help with that coagulation of the, of the semen. The semen is the sperm and everything in it. The last gland is the bulbal urethral glands and these are just mucus glands. <coughs> mucus is used for what? The lubrication, yep. Okay, so lubrication. And also because the vagina is acid or acidic, mucus is basic, it also helps with reducing the acidity in the female's reproductive tract so that the sperm can live. Okay, so here are the percentages of the contents you would find in semen. Semen is the sperm with all of the secretions from the glands. Okay, so a very small amount of the semen actually is made up of the sperm. Most of it is secretions from those other glands. So please note this right here. So the products from the testes, which is mostly sperm, is only about 5%. Um, and I think that's the big point from this slide. I'm trying to move along because so we need to do some female stuff. Um, Regulating of sex hormones is the same with females and males. Both are regulated by luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. You find them in both sexes. And they have very, very, very similar functions as well. And because these are secreted from your anterior pituitary, this means the hypothalamus is sending a releasing hormone to your anterior pituitary and then telling it to release luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone. So in males, what does luteinizing hormone do? Well, right here, it binds to those interstitial cells. Remember the interstitial cells make testosterone? So when luteinizing hormone is released, it binds to those interstitial cells and causes an increase in testosterone production. Cool. If follicle stimulating hormone is released in the male reproductive system, it acts right there on the seminiferous tubules and causes or more production of sperm. 
Oh, that was weird. Okay. Um, regulation of sex hormones. Oh, let's see. This, this is actually not one we need to worry about. Let's see here. We already know. We're skipping. We've got to get to the female before it's too late. Puberty. Okay, remember when I told you the difference between primary sex characteristics and secondary sex characteristics? Primary is what you're born with. Secondary is what occurs during puberty. Yay! Um, but while you were an embryo and a fetus in your mother's uterus, the placenta was secreting human chorionic gonadotropin, okay, which helps to um, support the pregnancy, but also, look at this, stimulate synthesis and secretion of testosterone by the fetus before birth. As soon as the baby is born, there is no more testosterone production at all until puberty. None. Okay? And so that testosterone present during development in the uterus helps with those primary sex characteristics. It's very important. And then pretty much no testosterone until puberty. And then all sorts of lovely things start to occur. Okay. Um, effects of testosterone, we've talked about this. We don't need to go into detail with this. Just primary and secondary sex characteristics. I know I'm skipping some stuff, but we've got to talk about the females. We don't have a lot of time. Um, so really quick about the erectile tissue of the penis. Okay, um, There's two things that are kind of happening as the male reproductive system starts to get stimulated. Um, NO actually means nitrous oxide, so that starts being released, and acetylcholine. And what they do is they actually, oh, it's hard to say, they, they cause blood to fill up the, they call them sinuses, but the erectile tissue areas with blood, and it prevents blood from leaving the connect the the erectile tissue, so it causes blood to continue to be pumped into the penis or the the erectile tissue of the penis, but the veins constrict and prevent any blood from leaving. So as blood continues to enter and none can leave, then it causes that erectile tissue to fill up and kind of then leads to an erect penis. Okay. Um, Okay, females. Sorry, we're going to try to get as much as we can. Least the important parts of the anatomy. We will not have time to talk about her reproductive hormone situation, which I know you're very much bummed about because it's complicated. So there's a lot of structures involved with the female reproductive system. Some are internal, you can't see, and others are external. Um, so ovaries, the uterine tubes, the uterus, the vagina, external genital, genital organs, so like the labia majora and menorah, the clitoris, um, and mammary glands. So mammary glands are considered part of the female reproductive system because their job is to feed, to provide nourishment to their infant that they had developed in their own body. Um, so within the female reproductive system, we're first going to be talking about the uterus. There are three main ligaments of the uterus, and it helps hold the uterus in place in the pelvic cavity. And so you have the broad ligament, round ligament, and then actually there's four, suspensory and ovarian ligaments. So I'm going to show you these here on this picture. And... This is not the uterine, the uterus that you will need to identify. So just remember again, in the handout, it looks more like this, a little more detailed. Um, but so the broad ligament, this guy here, it's like a giant sheet. And it is. It's the visceral peritoneum that has wrapped all the way around and cemented itself to itself. And so it's kind of created this envelope around the uterus. So this big sheet is a broad ligament. Then you have a suspensory ligament, which 
it's pretty small, but it, it has also encapsulates the ovarian artery and ovarian vein. You also have, let's see, a, a round ligament, which I got, normally you can't see it, you don't notice it until you become pregnant. So that's why I put this picture here of a pregnant woman to illustrate several things. Look at how much space is taken up by that growing fetus. A lot. Okay, here is the round ligament. Normally it is not stretched like that. It's usually, it's, it's pretty happy when the uterus is just doing its thing every single day, but if someone is pregnant and the uterus is growing, it's stretching out those ligaments. And unbeknownst to me until I became pregnant, I didn't know that it's very common for pregnant women to feel little sharp pains as their broad ligament is stretching. I actually was so worried, I called my doctor, I'm like, I'm having so much pain, and they're like, oh, it's just the ligaments, don't worry about it. They were right, but it's like, what? So ligaments are very important. Your uterus has to be held up into place. If your ligaments fail, you could deal with something called a prolapsed uterus, which means it starts to fall down inside the vagina. Okay, we don't want that to happen. Okay, so the equivalent of the male testy is the female's ovary. And this is where her eggs are developing. And unlike males, the females are born with all of the eggs they will ever be, ever have. And most of them they'll never even use. Throughout their lifetime, at most, they might ovulate 400 eggs in their lifetime. While in one ejaculation, a male maybe ejaculates 5 to 10 million sperm. Think about that. Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask you to identify the anatomy of the ovary, but... Note that there are two major sections. You have a cortex, the outer layer, and then you have your medulla. And what you find in those two regions are different. And so developing eggs or oocytes, it's happening in the cortex. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Getting to the important stuff. Okay. Ovulation, just so we remember what ovulation is is when that mature egg, let's see if I can find a picture for you real quick. Okay, can I blow this up a little bit? Okay, come on, come on, come on. Okay, so in this picture, if you follow that, kind of follow it this way and around, as an egg matures, the egg gets larger and then this kind of follicle, this round thing surrounding it, gets larger and larger and starts to fill up with fluid. Okay, and then you have your egg and it's surrounded by cells. Those cells that surround the egg right there, we call those little cells, there we go, the corona radiata. When you have all the cells pushed to the side and the rest of the follicle is filled with fluid, it's ready for ovulation. Ovulation is when the egg actually bursts free from that follicle and is released from the ovary. And it will have those little cells still attached around it, the corona radiata. Okay. Oh, wait, back up. Okay, so after ovulation occurs, after that egg is released, um, we now call it, we call it a secondary oocyte. And it's ready to be fertilized. The moment it's released, you can fertilize it if there's sperm there. So fertilization happens when a sperm is able to actually bind and penetrate through the plasma membrane of the oocyte. Okay, and what's really cool is that once one sperm gets in there, the wall of the egg, the oocyte, becomes impenetrable. So you can't get more than one sperm in there. It immediately, like, makes it impenetrable after one sperm enters, which is good. You don't want to have um, extra sperm, extra genetic material, which could actually cause problems. Um, this picture here, I'm just going to show you real quick. 
This is showing a mature developing follicle. You have your egg and you have your fluid filled cavity called the antrum. And as that continues to get larger and larger, it will be ready to ovulate. Oh, guys. Okay, this is a great picture. It talks a little bit, about, a little bit more about ovulation. I like this one because it gives you an actual real-time picture. Here's the egg. This is the ovary. And it's actually bursting free in that picture. So that's literally ovulation. And so when an egg ovulates, you could release a little bit of blood, the fluid that was in the follicle with it, and then most importantly, that egg, the oocyte. Um, okay, I know we're short on time, so I'm trying to pick the important things. Remembering, okay, you may have heard of different terms before, uterine tubes, fallopian tubes, oviducts, when I was younger, everyone just called them fallopian tubes, but the more common term now is uterine tubes, which are on either side of the uterus. So when that egg ovulates, it actually ovulates into your abdominal pelvic cavity, but luckily enough, the uterine tube, this is the exact picture, look it, I said no, no, no. Um, the uterine tube, here it is, ends enlarges and is somewhat wrapped around the ovary. It's not attached to it, but it's like right there next to it. And so most of the time when an egg ovulates, it, start, it enters into the uterine tube in this enlarged portion called the infundibulum. And this is the site of fertilization as well. Okay, so sperm have to travel all the way up to here, oh, different color, all the way up to the infundibulum to fertilize the egg, okay? And then from there, it takes seven days, no joke, for the, an egg to travel all the way down the uterine tube and to get to the body of the uterus. Seven days, fertilized or not. So you would know if you were pregnant for at least seven days post-intercourse just as an FYI. Okay. Oh, I don't want to stop. Okay, two things I want you to do. Know the three layers of the uterine tube. So they're right here. It's not, not hard. This again is that picture of the uterus and you're gonna do the anatomy anyways. And I want you to know the three layers of the uterus. Okay? Um, and so then we'll stop right there. And is there someone who's willing